I would go so far as to call plenty of bands that aren't really particularly heavy extreme. You know, they're still doing something that's on a, on a spectrum. They're on the far ends. They're on the extreme outlier. So, I mean, trying to be an outlier. There you go. That's it. And also, even the term heavy, it's like, what are we describing here? Is it is it, you know... 15 Marshall cabs on stage and, you know, the decibels are up here, or are we talking about something else? Like, you know, you could have, you know, Slayer is heavy, but also a band like Slint. Slint is super heavy as well. Like there's, I don't know, there's just so many different variations of the wording for metal these days. It's, it's strange. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. Hope you had a killer weekend. I most certainly did. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter, and I'm very stoked to have teamed up with them to bring you Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops Brutal Montreal 2022. This year's event is taking place on September 2nd at Corona Theatre in my hometown of Montreal and features Deicide performing their classic album Legion in its entirety as well as Cataclysm who will be performing their classic album Serenity and Fire in its entirety along with Inhuman Condition and Undeath. I am just so damn stoked about Heavy Montreal. Uh, You should be there with me. It's going to be a blast. We're going to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer together. What more could you ask for? Tickets for Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops Brutal Montreal are disappearing. If you would like to come to the show, I strongly suggest that you pick up your tickets right now via the link in the description of this podcast. You'll be pissed if you miss it. Trust me, it's going to be a blast. I'm beyond stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I would just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. There's someone in your life that just loves craft beer well let them know that the vox and hops metal podcast exists you could tell them that there are over 360 episodes where i sit down with metal musicians we talk all about their lives and their music while enjoying killer craft beers if you would encourage one of your friends to become a brand new vox and hops head that would be something that i would truly appreciate now today i'm stoked to be joined by rob lachance and ryan kennedy of wake get ready everyone this is vox and hops episode number 362 I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm very stoked to be joined by Rob Lachance and Ryan Kennedy of Wake. Uh, boys, how you doing? Excellent. Not too bad. Good. Very stoked to be hanging out with uh, some fellow Canadian metalheads. Uh, I love it. Love it to death. Uh, I don't believe we've ever met face to face. If we have, uh, I blame the craft beer. But uh, we're supposed to be friends from what I've heard, and I'm happy that we're now getting this introduction via Vox and Hops. Uh, Shittiest question. I'm going to get into far more fun questions after this one, but it's the one we all have to start with. Uh, How have you been coping with the glorious years, plural, of 2020, 2021, and hopefully not the rest of 2022? How have you been living through these fantastic moments? Busy? (laughs) Uh, actually, um, I think there is good things about COVID and bad things, obviously. The good things for us, at least, we used it to write a lot of music. Mm-hmm. We recorded two records over the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it, it was good and bad. You know, Devouring Ruin, our record uh, that came out right before the whole COVID thing hit the fan or whatever, uh, that all the plans for touring and that release kind of got shut down instantly because it came out, I think, the month before COVID mm-hmm. happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The bands like that, like, I, I, I always lump together the same three, four bands. Now you guys before, uh, Black Dahlia's record, Testaments. I think they're the people that really got hit the hardest because people weren't sure what the hell to do at that point. They were not jumping into using music as a cathartic release as we all have done throughout the rest of the pandemic, but definitely those first two, three months and you guys being a month before definitely got hit the worst out of everyone else releasing albums throughout the pandemic. Uh, Ryan, you lifted up your can of beer there. You said that you, you got through the, the, the pandemic by enjoying craft beer or beer in general. Uh, Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends talking about their lives, music and craft beer. Uh, what beers? 
are you uh, going to be sharing with me virtually tonight? Ryan, I believe I saw a little Phantasm logo on the can that you held up there. You did. You I, sure did. Wow, you have good eyes. I, uh, yeah, I is, know uh, my craft beer, yeah. but <laughs> This is a, a co-brew with a Phantasm and a local brewery called 88 Brewing mm -hmm. in Calgary who are a 1988 uh, uh, themed brewery. So it's a uh, and it's uh, it's an IPA, uh, a hazy IPA, I think. Yeah, it's called Cheat Code. So. Mm. Eighty-eight themed, and correct me if I'm. That was the Olympic year in Calgary. Am yeah, crazy you got that? it. There you yep. go. Yeah, that's their whole thing. Is they use the same font as the uh, as the uh, Olympics did, and like Amazing. if you go to the if you go to the bar, they have like all the stuff inside is all like from nineteen eighty-eight. Like they have like old TVs and stuff. Like it's yeah, yeah. It's kind of a. Uh, I mean, as a, as a kid who was four during the Olympics, I don't have a ton of experience with all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, I was there. <laughs> I do remember. I'm from Montreal, obviously. And I remember going to see the flame like the they do the marathon there as they run across the country. And I remember going with my family. I must have been. Math is not my strong point. Here. I was five at the time. And uh, I totally, totally remember that. So. Uh, Cheers to 88. I like that. And Phantasm is really cool. It's a basically a powder adjunct that they add into hazy beers most of the time. And it's uh, derived from New Zealand. And it is um, like a powder that like a, a grape powder that they would use in wines, typically, that they've nice. now used as an adjunct in hazy beers. Very cool stuff. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. How about you, Rob? What, what are you going to be enjoying tonight? I got a Calgary Classic uh, Skyrocket 6 from uh the establishment great brewery from calgary very nice uh, yeah great beer what great style beer. brew is that it's uh a new england nice yeah. i have uh three beers so i know you guys are craft beer enthusiasts so i'm gonna let you choose which beer i drink tonight with you guys but i was just invited to a rebrand as a very very important brewery here uh, i would say about 10 years ago they really hit the market and took over everything by storm with their distortion IPA. It's basically like a West Coast uh, bitter bite. It was everywhere. It was before the haze craze really hit Quebec. Everybody wanted to do jukebox. Everybody wanted jukebox. It was in restaurants. It was like really cool. And then they opened up another brewery. Under the same owners basically started another brewery called Avagal. And that brewery is doing so damn well. And they put so much energy into that brewery that it started to cannibalize jukebox. So either burn the bridges on Jukebox or rebrand it and try to do something fresh. They decided to rebrand. I was invited to the launch last weekend, two weekends ago. There are three of them. There's a, an American Pilsner and they're all basically retro style beers. So they're going back to classic American style beers. They got the retro Pilsner. Uh, they got a pale ale, 1990, not quite 1988. They're off by two years there. And uh, we got the retro IPA. Nice. I will let you guys choose. Which beer should I drink tonight? Which beer should we share virtually? The Retro, retro. IPA. Retro IPA. We got one vote for Retro IPA. Yeah, I'm going to second that, yeah. Excellent. You know what? That's when I went to the launch. That's the first one I tried because I love me some some Retro IPAs with, a, you know, like a, a little bit of bitter bite, a little bit of uh, citrus going on, floral, but still not being overly sweet. I cracked my beer. I would love to hear about your very first beers as I pour this out. Do you remember the very first beers that you guys ever drank starting with a, uh, Rob, go for it, your first beer, please. First beer, well, let, let's talk craft beer here. I think I was about 18 and I, I think the first one I ever had was in California and it was Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. I don't know if that still con is still considered, you know, craft brewer awesome. or not. That was my gateway beer as well. So, so absolutely, I completely stand behind that. Cool. Yeah, somebody brought uh, a case to show where we were at, and I was like, "What? What is this? It's not Kokanee. It's not Budweiser. You know, <laughs> it's got this bitter taste to it." I was like, "I don't know if I like this." <laughs> Drank it, came home, and that's all I could think about. And yeah, that's what got got me started. Long live, long live the classics that are still delicious. And Adam Zuniga from the Six Most Metal Breweries that works with them now. Shout out to you too. Uh, how about you, uh, Ryan? What would be your first craft beer experience? I mean, I mean, I spent most of my youth drinking uh, Black Label from from uh, uh, Saskatchewan, but I think there's one that I, when I was about 
19 or 20 that we would come in from the coast. We live in Alberta, yeah, as you know, and one that would come in from Vancouver, the Central City Red Racer IPA. And, and when, I, when, I first, uh, when I first moved out on my own, that was like the only beer that I could afford that wasn't like garbage. And they would have it at the store by the house me and my roommate lived in for pretty cheap. And, and I started picking that up. And that was that was probably that was probably step one for me, I think. So absolutely. Yeah. Another classic brew. Shout out to Ash from Revocation. Uh, three inches of blood at the time. Uh, we were playing Alberta. Oh, no, Armstrong Metal Fest. And Ash came out with a big cooler full of Red Racer IPA. So that's that's the first time I had that. I uh, love it. Cheers. I'm going to sip on this. I want to see massive cheers to the wake. Let's do it. Boys for hanging out with me. Cheers. Like back at you. Woo, got that. Like it's like caramel floor on the nose. Cool. And then bitter, citrusy, but not lemon, more like grapefruit. Really killer. Jukebox. I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I'm stoked to have you guys back in the in the fresh aisles. Uh, I'd love to hear about the soundtracks of your youth when you're growing up in your parents or guardian's house. What music was playing when you guys were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents or guardians listen to, starting with Rob? Ooh, lots of Bruce Springsteen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> lots. Uh, <laughs> I think my parents listened to that the most out of anything. It was, it was constant. There's like elementary school photos of me wearing Bruce Springsteen t-shirts and stuff. I wasn't even a big fan. <laughs> But, you will wear this. You will wear this on picture day and we will be yeah, proud. They they were classic rock fans. They liked tons of classic rock. Cheap Trick. So there was always music going on in my house. I love that. I just saw Cheap Trick for the first time with ZZ Top. And I didn't know how many hits they had first off. I was like, oh yeah, that's you too? I, I love when that happens. You go to these shows and you you know a few songs, but you don't realize how many hits they had. And then I felt bad for their guitar techs having to change so many strings because they basically all changed guitars every song and the guitars basically never come back but very sick and spruce stink uh, spruce stink springsteen <laughs> bruce springsteen my dad definitely had that born in the usa cassette in the car on oh, yeah. repeat for for most of my early youth for sure uh, how, about, how about you ryan um what would have been the soundtrack of your youth basically not what uh... you're listening to but what you were exposed to because uh, your parents listened to it Honestly, my parents did a pretty good job of trying to discourage me from liking music, which is probably why I like it so much. But there, there is definitely a memory as a child when we used to go to my grandpa's cabin. We would go and get in the boat and like do like um, two rides or whatever, you know, and, and there was only one tape in there. And it was the Tears for Fears Greatest Hits. It was for some reason, like, I think the only tape my dad would put in there and like, I just like had the song uh, head over heels stuck in my head for like like every summer basically and i still do i'm 38 years old so <laughs> I, I still love tears for fears they're still one of my favorite bands so yeah i guess that's that's one really nice thing that my parents gave me was uh yeah a loathing hate of playing music but what would it take me to that you mentioned that <laughs> They tried to discourage you. What, what, what's the story there? I feel like there's. Oh, wow. Well, uh, the truth I learned later was that my dad in his youth was a bit of a long hair himself. Mm. And uh, when when he was uh, when I was growing up, he, he uh, didn't want me to didn't want me to get into the same stuff. So he tried really hard to just convince me to just study math and, and do nothing else. And uh, of course, like I said, of course, it's, you know, it backfired. It's just like all the children of all the hippies in 1969 were in the Marine Corps. It's like, uh, you know, like uh, my dad tried to get me to be like a, you know, an academic and I, all I wanted to do was play the music he wouldn't let me listen to. So, well, wouldn't let me. As I got older, he, he mellowed out and realized it wasn't such a big deal. <laughs> you showed him. <laughs> uh, he, he's actually a big wake fan now. <laughs> so there yeah. you go. <laughs> That's a moment. I love that. My, my, my parents have always been very supportive. Uh, I'm curious, is, was there ever a moment where finally your father or your family's, I don't know if the same thing for you, Rob, they're uh, um, accepted that wake was actually working? Uh, I think my parents were already accepting of me playing music by the time I, I was playing in wake. So mm -hmm. sorry, here's my cat. Um, uh, I think the moment for my parents, I remember it, I played in another band about 12 or 13 years ago. And my dad, there used to be an HMV downtown, uh, in Calgary. And my dad worked downtown. And one day he came home and, and he phoned me when I was at my house and he said, your CD is in the store. Amazing. 
Like he just couldn't believe it. He was like, this is incredible. And I was like, yes, dad, we're trying to sell CDs. That's what you do when you're in a band. And he just was, he just couldn't believe it. He was just like, I don't believe this. Like you did it. Like, and it's like, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's, that was always the goal. And I think from then on, he really was like, Oh wow. Maybe, maybe he's really doing this. (laughs) What's your cat's name, by the way? It's Lily. (laughs) Hello, Lily. Uh, How about about you, Rob? Was there ever a moment that finally your, your, I don't know if your parents were accepting from the beginning. Uh, They definitely wanted you to play Bruce Springsteen. You, you definitely got more extreme than that. Uh, (laughs) What was their, 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 their mind process of you getting into more extreme music than what they were expecting you to or what they were showcasing to you i think that they kind of found it kind of like a novelty you know they thought it was funny or cute or whatever and they bought me my first guitar and thought it would be like i play it and you know give up or after a month and i just kept going with it and they kind of just realized that that's what i wanted to do and were very supportive about it and helped me you know, get other gear when I was a young t- young kid and just did whatever they could to, to make it happen. Amazing. And so they were always supportive. They're always behind you. There was never like this moment of, oh, your CDs and HMV. Uh, they were like, there was never really a moment. It was more or less, they kind of just understood where I was going, you know, and what I was doing and how much I liked it and just how it was going to be part of my life. They could see it, I guess. I love that. I love it. Uh, shows. Let's go to your very first music show. Please let it be Bruce Springsteen, Rob. Uh, what what it was? Do you remember the very first show that you went to go see? Okay, first major concert would have been Ozzy Osbourne and Filter, which was cool. Um, the Ecl- neighbor, eclectic neighbor, bill. Yeah, yeah, very, for sure. The neighbor uh, came down to our house and talked to my mom and said that. He had these two tickets for a rock concert down, you know, down at the Saddle Dome. And she, he knew that she had kids and, you know, me and my brother, and we had no idea who Ozzy Osbourne was, but he gave us the tickets and drove us down there, dropped us off. Me and my brother went and just, you know, the jaws dropped and it was just like, whoa, what is this? And it was like, I think the tickets were awesome. It was like 15 rows back. And wow. Yeah. The people like we were super small. I'm going to guess this is probably grade four. Wow. Yeah. And people like cleared a path so he could see people were like letting us stand on their chairs and stuff. And just, it was a really cool experience, but I guess the other, I guess maybe the more DIY shows that I went or like metal and stuff like that. Um, I went and seen this punk band called DBS from Vancouver. Um, they played at the Carpenters Union Hall in Calgary, which is a cool show. I guess that was my opening, my gateway to more punk and extreme stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool of your parents to let you go to that show alone. And shout out yeah. to Canadian metalheads for being nice to young metalheads. They are the future, and we should return the favor if ever we're in that situation. Please, uh, Ryan, do you remember that first show? Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it was uh, it was Matthew Goodband uh, at the Max Bell Center. Uh, I think I was kind of a late bloomer. I think I was like thirteen or fourteen. That was my first real show. So uh, yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, I still like Matthew Good Band, actually. He's but. fucking awesome, dude. Yeah, I love it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think Gob played. I think Gob was the opening band. <laughs> I don't really remember. <laughs> I, I, I oh, and Moist also played. Moist. See, that's played. cool too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, I think over time, the, the of the three, the one that's aged the worst is probably Moist. <laughs> <But> <laughs> if I just had to, I'm editorializing a bit, but, but I think I still think that the, the first three Matthew Good records are pretty awesome. I listen to them pretty regularly. So what was, hey. what was the Moist song? What was the big Moist song? So silver, many probably. silver. And then silver, the that was Creatures it. was the album after that. And they had Tangerine on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because that was the that first one. CD I ever bought. I remember. Oh, wow. That I was the first one? one? That was the first CD I ever bought. I bought that CD and I bought Portrait of American Family in cassette form. Why I bought one in CD and one in cassette, I don't know, mm-hmm. but absolutely. And then funny story, I was walking, what show was it? I think it was Shadow of Intent or something like that before the pandemic. And I was walking to, to the venue and I'm crossing the street and I'm like, that's David Usher. And he's looking at me ah. and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm David Usher. But, <laughs> it, I, but it, he had a big smile on his face and yeah, it was, yeah. I love Moist, yeah. Definitely That's aged cool. a little bit, but creatures. So those CDs, those first CDs, have such a weird emotional place yeah. in your heart that it, it's hard to push them out, even even though they've aged 
poorly, yeah. I would say. Machine Punch Through <laughs> is, is, is still a pretty cool song, I think. That's, that one's pretty cool. Piano work. There's not many rock bands that have that much good piano work. But uh, <laughs> continue with show, shows. Do you remember your first time on stage? We, we'll, we'll, we'll flip it up. Ryan, you go first this time. Oh, yeah, I definitely remember. Um, it, it was, was drums battle. first, right? Uh, I played guitar when I was very oh. young first. Uh, and so I was playing guitar. Uh, and it was a battle of the bands at, uh, at a high school. I think I was 13 or 14 years old. Uh, so about the same age as, as probably right around the same time I saw Matthew Goodman. Oh. Uh, yes, it was. And the, the craziest part about the battle of the bands that we played was that somehow we won having never played before but that one of the bands and rob and i have talked about this before one of the bands that played was like one guy who was in the high school and then like three like late 20s early 30 year old men <laughs> who, were, who were playing this high school battle of the bands and the craziest part about that is that one of the guitar players in that band later became my roommate so i actually wound up living with him like 12 or 13 years later <laughs> so, Love that. Love that. I definitely have done that in the past where I graduated, but my guitarist was still in high school and we played, we played the battle of bands. Nice. The, it was, it wasn't a battle of the bands. It was like a talent show. Right. So, so it was like a return, which was nice. Uh, how about you, Rob? Um, yeah, I remember it was, uh, we were like, just like probably like 12 or 13 and basement, you know, basement project type thing. And there was a guy that worked at the local record store that put on shows and he was like this old crotchety old guy and you know he always picked he always did really good shows pick legit bands or whatever and we go into the record store buy records or whatever and hassle them and be like yeah you should really let us play the show you know blah 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 he'd always say no always say no but we <laughs> we were rel relentless we'd go in there all the time be like we want to play a show we, you know you have the show coming up there's not a lot of bands on it you should let us play he's like fuck he's like okay we're gonna do this he's like you guys can play so we go down there, all the bands play, the headliner plays, and he says, now you can play. Ooh, so we played after the headliner. That's harsh. <laughs> it was, but we played and we were happy and yeah, it was, it was good. A little dark, but. <laughs> it's a bit harsh. It, it reminds me of Cannibal Corpse, Obituary, Cryptopsy, Abysmal Dawn in Louisiana. I don't think I've ever said this on the podcast. And uh, a band had petitioned to open the show despite there being a very strict no openers because it, that's a lot of bands it's a lot of bands there's a lot of gear and yes it's nice to support the local scene and i appreciate that and i, and I support that but when you're in the state of cannibal corpse and obituary you want to be comfortable at some point so i feel like they may have played before doors but i might be wrong there <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you could just do that you could just like start a petition and be like oh yeah can we get on the show like that's an interesting idea <laughs> We're hustlers. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> uh, thought thought form descent coming up soon in july um first record july 22nd sorry thought form descent is coming up july 22nd via metal blade records this is your first metal blades records release is that correct mm -hmm. that's good talk to me about that talk to me about the big jump uh one of the most exciting labels in extreme metal right now um if i could you know cryptopsy we just signed to something else that i can't talk about but uh if i could choose another one that i shouldn't be saying this it would be metal blade uh talk to me about uh, that feeling and when that happened and are you satisfied you guys seem very blase about this <laughs> oh yeah well we we we're all like every member of this band has been playing music for so long that and we've had our hopes and dreams crushed so many times that we don't we don't really get emotional about anything like that but yes the day we announced that we we were that we were joining up with metal blade it was it it actually was like we all gave ourselves a minute to sort of like get to you know say wow and start and step back and be like that was pretty cool <laughs> it's, it's pretty it is cool it, it's been it's been great so far uh you know it's it, they're they're on the one hand, they're like a huge independent label in terms uh -huh. of the size of independence. But on the other hand, you know, our 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 main guy came to our show in, in California and it was like really nice to everybody and it was great. And it was felt felt pretty much the same as any other experience I've had with the, with a good label where it's just like they, they know how to they know how to get good people 
to work for them. And, and, and that's really what, what makes the difference. So, I mean, yeah, we've, I felt really good about it and we're, we're having a great time so far. It's been awesome. That's the number one thing for sure is the people that work there are just all super down to earth and super cool and down to help you out any way they possibly can. Um, yeah, it was amazing when we got that email from them, you know, them saying that they were interested in what we do and wanting to work with us. And, oh, it's really cool. You know, Slayer, King Diamond, come on. And it's like a family band, uh, label. It's a, like a family label. Like once you're a part of the family, they stand, they tend to take care of you for the, your whole career, which is extremely exciting. I feel like once they, they build a band, they, they're committed to it. And there's space for, for movements within what the band wants to do. And they give you artistic freedom, but they stand behind you no matter what. And I think that's amazing. Congrats on that. Talk to me about this. Uh, I was reading. Uh, what you guys said about it before sitting down here. And there is a, a, a line that popped out um, describing the record, not brutal's gone, the, the gruesomeness, all these these descriptive words and, and extreme metal. That's something that Cryptopsy has been using, Morbid Angel has been using for a long time. Um, well, we can see who came up with that first. Flo has some opinions about that, but I don't care. Uh, but extreme metal is exactly a perfect term for extreme music, the way that we attack music. Uh, to talk to me about that statement, about describing your band and making that stance that it is extreme music, extreme metal, versus going in all to the, the overused, brutal, um, technical, all, all the stuff that what people like to label our bands as. I think Ryan wrote that. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> <laughs> Got to be careful know. what the publicists send us. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm always writing something. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, yeah, in the context of like looking at our band vis-a-vis, -vis, yeah, like in the same arena as as like a, a cryptopsy or, or or a band like that. I think I think there's a lot of different ways to look at at being the kind of band that doesn't have the same kind of goals that maybe you know Moist has. Like, I think, I think there's a pretty big difference. And I think that's really where, like, you can, if you use the word extreme, it's sort of meant to delineate the separation there. But I, I don't, I don't really, I see a lot of people try to, like, make it about the aesthetic of, of, of something, like, make it about, like, okay, this band has this blast beats at this tempo, they're extreme. Whereas this band has blast beats at 30 beats per minute less. So they're not extreme. It's kind of, it's kind of like, I, I'm, I'm, I just like the idea that if you're playing in a band that definitely has some counterculture elements, you can probably get away with calling yourself whatever you want. And, and if you want to call yourself extreme, then go for it. And, and I mean, that's, that's, I think that's, it's up to you. And that's, I guess that's the real crux of it is it's up to you. And if you decide to do that and, and do it, then you're probably going your own way. And that's good enough for me. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I would go so far as to call plenty of bands that aren't really particularly heavy extreme. You know, they're still doing something that's on a, on a spectrum. They're on the far ends. They're on the extreme outlier. So, I mean, trying to be an outlier. There you go. That's it. Sure. And also, even the term heavy, it's like, what are we describing here? Is it, is it you know, 15 Marshall Cabs on stage and uh -huh. the decibels are up here? Or are we talking about something else? Like, you know, you could have, you know, Slayer is heavy, but also a band like Slint. Slint is super heavy as well. Like there's, uh -huh. I don't know, there's just so many different variations of the wording for metal these days. It's, it's strange. It's all about perception, right? So it, and yeah. everyone's life stories and what they've listened to. And then if they do hear something and then, oh, for me, that reminds me of a Gorgats riff or that reminds me of a Dark Throne riff. So, so it depends what they've listened through their whole life if, when they're trying to classify a band. But extreme music it definitely touches so many things. And I think that's what's freeing about it, that term, and which is why Flo really liked using it because he could have jazz, he can have blast beats, he can have uh, slam parts. And, and it, there, was, there was no more uh, constrictions as long as we were pushing the everything to the 100th and 11th, the extremity of it. And combining these things, that's also extreme. So I think I think you're onto something. And I I, I am a str strong supporter of that terminology. And uh, there are far too many terms and far too many subgenres. And some people like doing that, but I just like listening to music. <laughs> yes, it's music. 
He worked with Dave Otero again on this one. I love him. He's a Vox and Hops alumni. Uh, my bassist was just with him for months doing the new cattle decapitation record. Uh, he just finished his bass parts uh, recently. I'm looking forward to seeing him. Shout out to Ollie. Uh, talk to me about uh, working with Otero again. Did you go that whole route? I love that he does this with bands and I hope that you guys did it. Uh, he did it with Archspire. Did you go and did you live on his compound? Did you, did you do the whole submersive experience with Otero? I like com I like compound. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to his his place as a compound from now on. That's, <laughs> yes, we did. We always stay there. It's it, it's kind of like it's pretty. It's not like out of the way, but it is pretty far from sort of the beaten path in Denver. So you'd have to like if you didn't want to stay with him, you'd have to stay at like a Super Eight, which is like no way. We'd way rather stay with him. So we 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 but stay it, with him. It's so much cooler too because an idea can happen at any time. And he's yeah. there with you and, and you know, well, well, let's just track this idea. You know, it, it's so cool. And I've never had an experience like that. So I'm jealous of it. Yeah, it's, pretty it's, amazing. it's good. Definitely. And he's also the type of producer that doesn't just push record. Which is also free. He, he always like finds his way into the each band that he works with. Yeah, which is something special in modern extreme metal producers, I would say nowadays. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think I think he kind of just uh, he has sort of like a, an open filter where he's just always something's always going through his mind and he's just not afraid to talk about it. And like and he's the best part I think about him with that is that he's not afraid to be wrong. And if he's wrong, he's like, hey, I was wrong. Let's move on to the next one. Like he's just got he's got a really good handle on, you know, what what to how to get to the best outcome instead of just being like, well, I want to do this, or I want to do this. It's like, no, we're here to make the best thing. And and he's just got a really good threshold of when to push something and when to drop something. He's, he's good at that. He, and he like, he helps you be more chill. Like he's good. He's good at like loosening everybody up. I think it's like, it's pretty good. Like instead of nobody dies on the hill, uh, the riff hill anymore, you know, like, well, we, we kind of gave that up before we started recording Dave, but, but, but anyway, he, he helps you sort of even, be willing to just play anything just just like try whatever like it doesn't make any difference like let's just see what happens so that and he's really good for that so mm -hmm. yeah that's a really good thing from him he's he's got a got away with that on um, thought form to say what would be like one part of the record or something about the record that you would not be the same if it wasn't for otero mm. the pick slide. dude loves pick slides loves them <laughs> loves them can't get enough i'm telling you my fingers are raw after that, that day of picks day of pick slides i'm telling you no right? way <laughs> yeah, yeah. nice i love it i love it <laughs> uh you guys are a canadian band cryptops is canadian band do you feel and i have some history with members of my band that do feel this that being canadian is sort of a restricting thing for an extreme metal band yeah, in a lot of a lot of ways. <clears throat> um, I don't even know where to begin. It's the drives for one. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a place where the close the next city is you know three hours away. Mm -hmm. Next city after that six. Next city after that eight, and then Vancouver is twelve. Like just the drives for one. Getting anywhere in Canada is very very difficult. It's a lot different than you know a lot of bands that are in you know super populated areas where every weekend you can kind of strategize and and hit up new cities every single weekend it's like we we, we don't have that option uh less less people um there's also difficulties for canadian bands touring the u.s with you know where these populated areas are um man i could go on and on you know i really could it's it is difficult even... it's difficult and, and and a lot of tours don't hit most of Canada, there's the North American tour and there's three Canadian dates, typically Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver for some reason. And the prairies and everything else gets forgotten. Sorry, North American tour. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, well, what's your take on, on being the struggles? Let's say let's let's call this sub segment yeah. the struggles of being a Canadian extreme metal band. Yeah, it's, I mean, one of the things all the years I've spent sort of paying attention to this is that you see like a really heavy like siloing effect, like every every city is its city and like the, the bands that are of a certain type, like that's their territory and they don't go far and everybody, the, the locals have the local bands. 
and then once somebody's not a local band anymore they're they're they belong to the world you know that's that's kind of just at least in western canada and and, and i think it's part of that of course is just because everything like rob said is so far apart and isolated that mm-hmm. it just you just don't there's no way to sort of have everybody coming back and forth. And, you know, like if you're in Philadelphia, a band from Baltimore comes and plays your same venue every week, probably. And that's just the part of that's It's just ingrained in everybody's consciousness. And, and for, for, you know, our, our neck of the woods in Western Canada, it's kind of like, well, like you said, no one comes here. So when they come here, it's sort of like, well, yeah, we got to, you know, the only, the couple of bands that sound like that open the show and everybody who knows all the couple of bands that do it are all, are all there. And, you get a bit of a silo effect because there's there's no a lot of the local bands don't travel you know because it's too much it's hard <laughs> you know they, they, they don't they don't, they don't want to do it. It, it, it's a lot you know and uh I, but you know what i think a lot of the the best bands in canada wind up going the same path and turning that into like a strength uh-huh. so like that's that's kind of why like a band like for example like revenge like they're really popular but they took that isolation and just instead of sort of just playing in a band and being that band, they they let themselves get influenced by being that isolated. And that's why they sound like they do. And and I think it's cool. I think it's 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 hard, but it's cool. And I mean, you know, that's sort of one one positive outcome from being, you know, kind of in a place that's, you know, really, really not got too much uh too much uh, urban urban environments. <laughs> I I just say that every show that I've ever played in Calgary, Alberta. Winnipeg, anywhere. Some of the best shows I've ever played, and a lot of bands have told me that. So, yeah, come on, bookers, make it work. The fans are there. The bands have fun. They buy lots of merch. It's always a good, good night. Uh, this is a Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops episode. I would love to hear about your favorite, craziest, funniest, silliest Montreal experience. Hmm. You do have a killer show coming up, uh, Turbo House, which is a, a very, very cool local establishment that I love very much. And I choose all the craft beer for. You do? I do. Oh, amazing. That place yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Sergio? Sergio's great. Yeah. Sergio and Michelle and the rest of the crew. Shout out. Awesome. Can't, can't wait to play there. I'm trying to think, okay, Montreal, Ryan, what happened last time we were in Montreal? Anything we can talk about? That was <laughs> a month not even a month ago uh nothing really crazy happened though we were pretty we're 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 pretty mellow the show was crazy i mean that was origin we were playing with origin at fufon and yes the show was pretty crazy because origin's pretty crazy so there was like wall of death and like people people floating around while they were playing that chicken was pretty fight. crazy um jason, jason used to do the chicken fight circle pit Oh yeah. I don't know if he still does that, but I remember watching him do that when he was fronting Didn't skinless he do that at the time. Skinless. Yeah, skinless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fufon first, yeah. first time playing Fufons, which is super cool. Always wanted mm-hmm. to play there. Such an amazing venue. Um yeah, man. I just think we all got pretty hammered and went back to a bud's house and passed out. Amazing. I love that. I love that. Uh new segment that I have, uh something important. I, I'd like to talk about mental health. I'd like to talk about how you cope with when you're not feeling well, if you're ever feeling down and depressed, what what do you do to make yourself feel better? And then a secondary question is, if you feel like one of your buds or one of your friends is not doing well, what do you do to help them get out of the darkness? It's a heavy, heavy subject, but I think it's important to talk about nowadays. Yeah, that's, that's, I don't want to bum everybody out. <laughs> that's because, you know, it's a, uh, it's a bummer, but yeah, I mean, uh i don't know if if there's there's like a full scale coping for depression i think i think it's more like just a mediation process for most people and i think i think it's good to find a way to have good habits and i think it's good to sort of take um the things in your life that you can find that 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 become wins and uh-huh. in in the context of the things in your life that you can't really control which is you know this the state of of, of depression, you know, and, and trying to find ways where it's like, well, if I can build a routine around something like this, I can help like mediate my, my needs to, to be a little bit um, more positive. And, and then, like you said, so you're saying like, what's the, what's the thing? I mean, I, I'm, it's, it's, I hesitate to say it because it's sort of one of those things that people always say, but like, 
I really do find exercise really helps me if I'm not doing well. Like well, during the pandemic, I, mean, I think we everybody can relate that it was a it was a time when a lot of people had to come face to face with uh, whatever whatever issues that they had faced in their lives in a much more uh, profound way. And and yeah, the, uh, I found that you know I really doubled down on exercise and 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 stuff like that, and that that made a big difference. And always does make a difference. And I, I know I know that you know. A lot of my friends who, who deal with that don't really want to hear the like the yeah just go for a run that'll make you feel better it's kind of like oh you know it's always more complicated than that but 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 for well, me the better tactic would be why don't we go for a run together maybe yeah that's a good point you're right um yeah so for me personally i'm lucky enough to have something like that 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 is very helpful so mm. that's that would that'd be I'd, I'd put that in i guess how about that's you a, rob yeah that's a, i 100 percent agree with ryan again like I think that any kind of exercise and stuff like that, at least for me, that's how I, I deal with a lot of stuff like that. It's, it's always a win to complete something like that. You know, you know, you get on, you, you go for a run, you lift some weights or whatever. After that, you know, you're, you're going to feel better about something, you know, about yourself, about things, you know, um, I don't know that the whole mental health thing is, is a struggle for everyone. And it's, I think it's, it's, a personal thing and there's a million mm -hmm. different different things going on with that so hard mm -hmm. to narrow it down to just a few things absolutely it's like when i talk to sober artists and what advice they have for other people that might be struggling and typically they always tell me you have to find your own way there's no one set way to do this but l focusing on little wins is the first time i've heard that answer mm -hmm. and i think that's important because the loss hurts so much and, and it, I, I i've spoken about it reading youtube comments let's say when I release something new, we never remember the goddamn positive ones. We only remember that one negative comment. So, so yeah. focusing on the wins in your, if you're feeling in a bad way and, and setting yourself up to succeed, whether it be through uh, easy attainable goals for exercise could be a very smart way to, to help put yourself forward. That's, that's an interesting tactic to, 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 fight depression and, and put yourself in a better place. Uh, the, the other side of the question was, if you, if you feel like one of your friends is not doing well, what do you do? What is your tactic? I just helped Ryan find one going and running with them. Uh, what, what, what else could we do to help our friends? Of course, checking in as much as you can. I, I have no filter for that kind of stuff. If I see a friend of mine struggling or needs help or just appears to be not doing very well, I'm, I'm all over them and that's how really think everybody should be with their friends you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's the same it's it's there's sort of a i think a tendency to that that when people communicate with somebody that they might perceive as as being in difficulty that they approach it a certain way and i think my my i've definitely uh spent a lot of time with people in 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 a very particular uh emotional state and and the best way i've always found is to just like approach a conversation where you're listening to them talk about it without uh, without making it feel like there's any like it doesn't feel deviant or like outside or like weird you just have to normalize the conversation and just like let it happen and and instead of like taking something heavy and being like wow yeah that's really heavy you have to just normalize the things they're going through so that they can feel you know uh, in in a position where they don't need to be fixated on the state and they can they can just sort of communicate in a way where it's 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 just an open slate and and uh yeah i tried that a, a lot you know especially since like i i went through a, a period in 2017 where I, I was not doing well and the best conversations i had that's what it was was they 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 the people knew to normalize the circumstance i was in and to just say like yes so what you know, like, yeah, that's, this is what's happening. So what, you know, like, let's just go, let's just go for dinner. You know? And it's like, uh -huh. it's like, yeah, that helps, that helped me the most. And I try to help others help. Out. I try to, I try to have conversations with people who I, I know are looking for support that way. And I think, I think it's good to do that because that helps people realize like, well, I know it's, it's hard not to fixate on, on the difficulties of your situation, but the truth is, is that you're still a person and you're still a normal person. Like you haven't done anything to put you in a position where you're not like in you're, you're, you're still on equal footing with everyone around you, despite whatever thing you're going through and, and everyone is going to treat you that way. And I, I think that's, that's, that helped me the most. And I, I, I have found that that's also been something that, you know, my, my peers feel good about. 
and I can tell, I think. <laughs> mm. Yeah. That is very wise to, to normalize it uh, and just taking someone out to dinner type sort of thing. If, if, they're, if they're in a dark place, they tend to want to be alone. You normalize the situation and then bring them into a different context might actually help them as well. And then being in that different context, they might speak differently as well because you're, you, you're just receptively taking everything, normalizing it. Excellent, excellent, excellent advice right there. Back to craft beer. Uh, my friend, good friend, the, the metal architect, Fox and Hops is metal architect, the, the one, the only, Jerry Monk uh, from Dallas, Texas, went to Vector Brewing and he mentioned that he was going out to the show and the guy gave a whole packs and packs of beers for the Wake Boys. So, so <laughs> talk to me about <laughs> your, the love of craft beer, how your band has become now associated to it. Well, what's that story there? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, it's kind of funny because I met Rob in 2010 or 11, I think. I forget yeah. which one it was. The 10, yeah. it was 10, 2010. And uh, at the time I was like really, really serious about homebrewing. Like it was like the oh, thing yeah. I was doing. Like I was, that was, I had was drilling the holes in the kegerator and everything. Like I was, I was over the top. And um, I think I, 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 uh, I had some on tap and I gave it to Rob one day when he came over to, pro to practice. It was an ESB. It was an ESB. It was an ESB. That's right. Yes. It was an English special bitter. And, and, uh, which are now back in style, by the way. Yeah. Right. With your retro IPA, there is uh, yeah. probably a little similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, that sort of is, I think, established sort of like me and Rob associating playing music with drinking good beer. <laughs> and so, like, for a lot of tours, we would go to, you know, we went to other half when we went to New York, we went to, I mean, we've gone to all kinds of breweries. I can't, I'm even drawing a blank because we've gone to so many breweries like over the years on tour. And, and I think it's always kind of in, in my mind been like, yeah, if we, if we have the bandwidth to go to a place to get good beer, that's probably priority, you know, one or two. Anyway, it's up there. <laughs> they, they have food at the breweries too. So it's, it's a two for one thing. True. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you can bring baby wipes, and they have bigger bathrooms than the stalls at the <laughs> venue. So, so there, there's lots of wins here. That's right. Maybe well. it's close yeah. to a like a laundry mat, a laundromat. You could put your laundry and then go drink, and then you never know. That could be good. <laughs> Maybe not even make it back to the show to play. I don't know. <laughs> Priority <laughs> number one is to play the show. Out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. We just we love beer. We've loved beer for so long, and uh, being fortunate enough to to tour and go around to all these cities and you know, go to breweries. Um, there's so many metalheads involved with brewing beer now as well, which is really, really cool. Um, so we do get a lot of people coming out to the shows, you know, bringing beer or offering to, you know, offering us to come check out their breweries, which is super cool. Uh, Vector, um, they like it, like you were saying, they brought us a bunch of cool beers. Uh, Level Brewing in Portland on this last run. They, uh, sorry, our last run in March, not this last one, but uh, we did a run in March and they brought us out a bunch of beers great notion metalheads everywhere involved with brewing these days and it's it's really cool it's it's such like a, a like a culty thing as it is you know uh it just it, metal and beer just go hand in hand i love it i love it i don't know if you've done it if you have i apologized if you have i i apologize uh have you made a wake collab beer yet talk yep. to me about that story what, what, what was that what brewery was it uh yeah i love this story actually um because we were driving on we were on tour and we were driving and uh our our manager shannon phoned rob and was like so you guys do know that you're driving past a brewery named wake and it's a yeah. metal themed brewery you know that right you know, <laughs> and we were it. like no and and she was like well you guys i'll call them and you should go over there and talk to them <laughs> and so we did we we uh we stopped uh, we stopped in the the Quad Cities in in Illinois. Um, Rock Island is Rock Island. Yeah, yeah. Quad, the Quad, I always call it Quad Cities because the yeah, across yeah. the river or whatever. But yeah. yeah, Rock Rock Island, and we stopped in to visit them, and like it was kind of like it was sudden, and they kind of were a little bit like, okay, hey guys, like uh, that, you're you're here, and and over the course of the afternoon, we kind of just like started talking and and had a great time, and and they showed us around, and we we had a we had a blast chat chatting with Jason and and justin and everybody the and brothers. so much that uh by by the time we, we couldn't really 
drink any that much or even anything. I think I, I think I just had a taster, but we because we had to play a show, so we we drove on to go to DeKalb. And uh, Jason was so stoked that he got in the car and drove the two hours to come see us in the <laughs> that night, which was, I Amazing. mean, I will net that will blow me away forever. Like, it's just what like I knew right then that they were like really, really cool dudes. And like, they'd played bands forever. And like he, Jason's been booking shows for a long time. So he's got lots of, he's been around for a while. And, and then the next year we played the decibel metal and beer fest in Philadelphia and yeah, we had the co-brew with Wake called Paradigm awesome. Lost. Uh, and so it's a Wake-Wake collab. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it's, it came out amazing. I, I love it. We, they had a couple left over for us in March when we came through and saw them. And so we got to have it again. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's perfect. So I'm cool. The brothers are amazing. Uh, yeah. They were part of uh, Brutal North America. When, when I set all that up, uh, they made a beer for me. Cool after that. Love them. They were super easy to work with and mad hype. Very, very cool. If you could do a brand new beer for this record, Thought Form Descent, what brewery would you join up with? Uh, no, no disrespect to Wake if it's not them again. It can be them again. Uh, what style of beer would you make? Uh, let's let's get creative here. I think we talked about this already, but I, I would go with Wake. Those are our, our homies and master brewers. And Ryan had... What, what was the beer we were talking about the other day? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I haven't brewed beer for a while, but I do occasionally still have ideas about beer. <laughs> so we're, I think I would hopefully get to do like a, like a West Coast IPA with like a, a, a cool adjunct, like maybe like put some cardamom in there or something with, uh, with a bit of Crystal 30. So it's kind of got that like special B kind of sweet taste in it. You know, I'd be, that'd be kind of fun because I've been, I've been back on my West Coast ipa bullshit lately mm -hmm. uh i i love the green flash ipa if you've had that one and uh, it's uh it's a little it's darker so it's, it's got it's like a little it's bit good. more the uh, malt uh and i i used to love that and i kind of really i guess i fell for the haze craze as you called it and i that was all i really drank for a long time but now i'm coming back to the kind of like balanced west coast ipas with some bitterness you know like a little little bit of centennial in there you know that really uh sorry I'm, i've uh i've gone too far now we're no, in, i love it no, we're i love it. <laughs> I love it i love it that's what it's vox and hops come on it's, it's perfect 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 I, I like it and i'm excited for this to happen and to try it hypothetically uh, i have one last question probably does happen to you guys a bit too much but before that actually i have another question sorry um you you mentioned going to visit breweries and stuff what is the line where you know that you have to stop before you play a show. Okay, I've learned this on a few occasions. <laughs> Ryan, had, Ryan had mentioned that we went to other half and all those are big boy beers, all of them. Mm -hmm. They were like eight to 10%. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we had a couple too many and you know, the show, you know, the show still rocked or whatever, but it was a little rough. <laughs> it was more, more work for you than it had to be. Definitely. And I think that was, I don't know. Usually we're pretty good about going out and stuff. Like we usually save the breweries for off days or um, after we play that kind of thing. Um, yeah, we're pretty careful. But just that one other half time was a little scary. I think we have to be. I mean, and it's the reason that we're in the city primarily, the first, first, first reason is to perform a show. <laughs> exactly. So we should do that well, despite <laughs> wanting to have fun and taste everything. Uh, how about you? One. I get one. Okay. Just give me one. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My, my mistake was at a wedding. I've spoken about it on the podcast before. We, we Cryptopsy performed at a wedding. <laughs> the bride hired nice. Cryptopsy to play two tracks for the groom, but we had to hide in a small city. It was in, in the, the country here outside of Montreal, in the south of Montreal. And uh, we had to go to this little village. We ended up at a karaoke bar. <laughs> we had lots of fun. Then we went back to the, to the wedding and I did not listen to my rules. It was still okay. The, the, the groom was still happy, but it could have been better. Uh, how about you, Ryan? Yeah, it's, I just can only have one. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's, uh, and not even, it's not even really because I don't know that I could play. It's more just like, I, I'm not really comfortable drinking that early more than one. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's just kind of like, oh, I'll have, I'll have one beer. And then after we play, yeah, there's something cool around. I'll, I'll try. I like to just try whatever random thing is nearby. Just have one cool IPA or something. Mm -hmm. That's that's uh that's usually my jam. Sounds like we need to go on tour. Yeah. yeah. 
day drinking is dangerous. It'll get you in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, the worst <laughs> decisions come from day drinking. 100%. Uh, one last question, classic Vox and Hops wrap up question. And probably does happen to you guys because you like beer as much as I do. Uh, what are your hangover cures? Hmm. Oh man, I don't know if there is a cure. Uh, <laughs> the more I do this, the more I know it's not real. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's probably best. I, I feel the same. <laughs> Water and cheeseburgers, dude. That's it. There you go. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, like five liters of water. Uh, probably like uh, pet my cat for five hours and uh, sort of struggle with the existential crisis. And that's probably as good as I'm going to get. I'm not a hair of the dog guy, if that's what you're looking for. I know I don't do that. That's not me. No. <laughs> that's a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous really? spiral then. Yeah. yeah. Can't do it. It leads into day drinking, which bad decisions come from. There you go. That's right. <laughs> Myth, the don't, do it. <laughs> hair the dog, don't do it. Don't do it. Rob Ryan, thank you so, so much for taking some time hanging with me, talking about life, metal, and craft beer. I had a blast. Everyone go check out that brand new record, Thought Form Descent. Came out via Metal Blade Records. It's a banger. You guys are going to love it. Massive cheers to you guys. This was great. I can't wait to uh, hang out, hopefully tour together. I think that would be dangerously fun. Cheers. 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 Yes. Matt, you rule. Thank you so much for having us. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an awesome conversation. Jerry Monk, you were right. I was going to get along with these guys. Such a great conversation. Such an insightful look into what it is to be a Canadian artist. It's not easy being an extreme metal artist from Canada. We have our limitations, our restrictions, as we talked about during this conversation. Everyone go check out Thought From Descent, that brand new Wake album. It just came out last Friday, and it's an absolute banger. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. You're not going to regret that. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do it on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that you shall receive two emails a month that will contain all the details of everything that has been happening recently in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal podcast. You'll get to see which artists I've had on recently, which artists I have coming up. You'll get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently. You will get to see which albums Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is available on both Apple Music and Spotify. If you're looking for new music to listen to, well, the Brutal Awakenings playlist is what you want to be listening to. But more more than all of that, you will get to find out about any new projects I have in the works before I announce them to the public. And trust me, I always have a lot of things going on behind the scenes. So do me a favor, sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast's mailing list because I don't want you to miss a single thing. The Fox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer rest of the week. I have one more episode coming up this Friday, and it's actually going to be the last episode until September because I am taking the month of August off. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Fox and Hops heads. Oh,